Hello. Now we're going to talk about the overall approach to the traumatically injured patient. Management of trauma always begins with a primary survey. The primary survey is a standardized way of performing your initial assessment of all trauma patients, and it should be done exactly the same way every single time in every single case so you don't miss anything. There are two major goals of the primary survey. One is to identify life threats quickly, and two is to provide stabilization when life threats are identified. It's very important to remember that the primary survey isn't just about diagnosis. It involves simultaneous assessment and treatment of the patient to ensure that they remain stable and that life threats are quickly addressed. The primary survey follows the same order every time. It begins with airway, followed by breathing, circulation, disability, and lastly, exposure of the patient and assessment of the environment. So when we talk about assessing the airway, the first thing to do is simply speak to the patient. Gask them their name, get them to tell you uh, what happened to them. Any patient who's able to talk by definition has a patent airway, and that's clearly a good sign. However, remember, just because you have a patent airway right now doesn't mean you're going to have a patent airway 15 or 30 minutes from now. So you want to not only identify current airway obstruction, but also risks for potential future airway obstruction. What if the patient's not actually talking to you? Well, the question you should ask yourself is why? If the patient is unconscious or unresponsive, then that suggests a head injury. And if they have a significantly depressed GCS, you probably want to go ahead and provide definitive airway management in the form of intubation. If the patient is conscious, but they're unable to phonate, they're trying to speak, but they're... This is a sign of, emerge of significant airway injury, and you want to make sure that you address that quickly. This is a situation where you're going to want to um, emergently intubate the patient or otherwise manage the airway if intubation is impossible. So what are the kinds of things we're looking for in terms of airway life threats? Well, for patients who have a currently patent airway, but you want to know whether they're going to um, lose their airway in the future, things you want to look for are swelling, so any kind of hematoma in the face and neck, um, any kind of edema in the face or neck, these can compress the airway. You want to look for bleeding, in particular nasopharyngeal bleeding that's going from the pharynx back into the uh, oral cavity can cause aspiration, so we want to be aware of that and address it. And then lastly, we want to palpate for crepitus. And we do that by feeling for that crispy, crunchy feeling in the neck and upper chest. This suggests some kind of injury to the airway structures, either the larynx or the trachea, um, which again would mandate definitive airway management. While we're thinking about the airway, we always want to think about the cervical spine. So the cervical spine should be immobilized in trauma patients in case they do have an injury. Um, and any time a patient has a high C-spine injury, they can actually lose their respiratory drive. There's a rhyme, C345 keeps the diaphragm alive, so patients who have injuries in those regions of the spinal cord might have impaired respiration, not because of an airway problem, but because of difficulty breathing from diaphragmatic paralysis. Lastly, we just want to think about burns. We have a whole separate lecture about burns, and we'll talk about the burned airway there. But for patients who do have any kind of burn as part of their trauma, you want to just remember that thermal injury can cause airway edema, and inhalational injury can uh, cause damage to the lungs, which in turn can make the patient hypoxic. So these are all things that you want to think about um, for the airway of an injured patient. Whenever you do identify airway compromise, either currently or you think it's going to imminently develop, you want to go ahead and intubate your patient. However, in trauma, there's often distortion of the normal anatomy. If the patient has swelling or bleeding or facial fractures, those kinds of things, the airway might be very technically challenging. And to further add to our technical challenges, we have to maintain spinal immobilization. We can't just crank the patient's neck in any direction because we don't know whether or not they have an underlying injury. So you need to be really proficient with airway management if you are going to tackle a trauma airway. And if this isn't something you have a lot of experience with, you probably want to get back up from an anesthesiologist. Although for emergency physicians, of course, we would expect this is something you would be able to handle.
Always bear in mind that if you're unable to intubate successfully um, in a non-invasive way, you need to think about the possibility of a surgical airway. So a surgical cricothyrotomy would be the procedure we would use for patients who have severe uh, facial or neck injuries that preclude intubation. And again, if you're going to be managing trauma airways, this is a procedure that you need to master. Now, we're going to move on to breathing, and I'll tell you, in my 15 years of practice experience, I can tell you that traumatic injuries to the airway are actually relatively rare. I've only seen a handful in all my years of practice, whereas pulmonary injuries, chest injuries that lead to respiratory compromise, these are very common, and these are something that you see regularly in the emergency department. So airway is incredibly important, and airway injuries are really life-threatening. But breathing is where you're going to find more pathology and more often need to intervene. When you're assessing a patient's breathing in trauma, one of the first things you want to do is listen to their breath sounds bilaterally. And what you're listening for are the presence of equal bilateral breath sounds on both sides of the chest. You also want to look and just get an overall feel for their respiratory effort. You know, of course, you're going to note their respiratory rate, and you're probably going to pay attention to specifically what they're doing when they're breathing. But at the beginning, if you just get a visceral sense of whether they're kind of chilling, breathing comfortably, or if they're working really hard to breathe, they're using additional muscles and they're having to pull air in, that should give you a sense of the severity of their respiratory compromise. You, of course, want to count the respiratory rate. Again, this is a vital sign that is often documented incorrectly and one that you really want to double check yourself. And you should always be concerned about a patient with significant tachypnea because that's somebody who could tire out and really get themselves into trouble shortly. And then lastly, your respiratory vital sign is your oxygen saturation. The whole purpose of the lungs is to get oxygen into the blood. So you need to know if they are fulfilling that purpose effectively or not. While we're assessing breathing, we want to be looking for evidence of pulmonary life threats, and there are four major ones we want to think about. Tension pneumothorax is by far the most common um, and most serious in the trauma setting, but you can also see open pneumothoraces, flail chest, which is always associated with underlying pulmonary contusion, and then massive hemothorax. Whenever you suspect that a patient has a compromise of their breathing, we always want to initiate supplemental oxygen. You should give them whatever flow they need to keep their oxygen saturation normal, which is typically going to be above 95% for somebody with healthy lungs. You also want to initiate emergency treatment for any patient in whom you identify a life-threatening pulmonary injury. Now, we have a whole other lecture on chest trauma, and I'm not going to get into each of these too much right now, but there are immediate interventions for each one of these injuries that you can perform during the primary survey to stabilize your patient. Once your patient is stable and you're satisfied you don't have an immediate life threat in the pulmonary domain, um, we want to get a chest x-ray to evaluate their lungs um, and get a sense of what's going on with them from a pulmonary injury standpoint. But we don't want to be getting chest x-rays until we're satisfied that the patient is stable. Moving on to C, um, circulatory insufficiency is very common in trauma. Obviously, trauma is associated with bleeding. So we very often see patients who have significant blood loss and circulatory compromise as a result of that. The things you want to look for when you're thinking about a patient's circulation is just their overall appearance. Are they pink and perky, or are they pale or cyanotic or altered? These are things that should uh, help you get sort of an overall global sense of the adequacy of their perfusion. You can also look at things like capillary refill, and obviously you want to look for signs of external bleeding because a patient who has a wound that's actively hemorrhaging, you're clearly going to want to control that bleeding before you do much of anything else. We also want to feel their peripheral pulses. And the peripheral pulses are really important because they give you a quick sense of the patient's blood pressure, which is really the uh, bottom line on the adequacy of their perfusion. So a patient who has a nice, bounding, easily palpable dorsalis pedis pulse has a systolic blood pressure of 90 or more. So that's a pretty quick way, if you feel those dorsalis pedis pulses and you're satisfied that they're, um, that they're palpable and normal, that is a, a pretty quick way to say, yeah, you know what, my patient's circulatory status is probably adequate, at least right at this moment.
Moving farther proximally, radial pulses indicate a systolic of at least 80. Femorals can uh, indicate a systolic of at least 70. And you don't lose your carotid pulse until your systolic go goes below 60. So really, getting a feel for which pulses are present and which pulses are absent can give you a pretty accurate sense of what your patient's blood pressure is and whether or not their perfusion is adequate. Of course, once you get your patient hooked up to the monitor, you want to know what their heart rate is and you want to know what their blood pressure is because these are our circulatory vital signs and they're going to be used to guide our resuscitation and help us decide whether or not our resuscitative efforts are effective. So our big circulatory life threat, like I already mentioned, is going to be hemorrhagic shock. Um, trauma is strongly associated with blood loss, and this is by far the most common cause of death among traumatically injured patients. However, we want to consider other causes of shock as well, specifically tension pneumothorax and cardiac tamponade. Both of these are forms of obstructive shock where the injury prevents normal blood flow back to the heart from the venous circulation and impairs cardiac output that way. Again, we're going to talk about both of these disease entities in some detail in future lectures, but you should be aware that not all shock in trauma is going to be related to hemorrhage. There are these other disease processes that can lead to shock. All right, while we're managing circulation, I already alluded to this before, but clearly if a patient has blood spurting out of a wound, you're gonna wanna apply some direct pressure to that to get that bleeding under control. This is gonna be one of our uh, immediate maneuvers that we do during the primary survey to stabilize the patient. In addition, we wanna make sure that our patient has adequate IV access. This means two large bore peripheral IVs. So you don't want just one, you want two because you wanna back up in case uh, yours falls out or infiltrates. You wanna make sure they're large bore so that you can get a lot of fluid through them if you need to. If you can't get large bore peripheral access, you have other alternatives. You can place an intraosseous line or you can place a trauma line, which is a specialized central venous catheter that's very large in diameter and allows uh, large volume resuscitation. When you do initiate fluid, you're always going to start with isotonic crystalloid, so generally normal saline or lactated ringers for most patients. Now, every now and then, if you know up front there was a large amount of blood loss, either because the patient is actively losing blood right in front of you or because the paramedics report that there was a lot of blood at the scene, you might consider going straight to blood transfusion, but generally we're going to start off with isotonic crystalloid and only move on to blood if we don't get a satisfactory response from crystalloid. Again, we're also going to be looking for specific injury patterns, and we're going to be providing treatments based on those underlying injuries. We're going to talk about tension pneumothorax and cardiac tamponade in future lectures, um, so don't worry too much about that right now, but understand that certain disease processes have specific treatments that you need. You're not just going to treat all hypotension or shock with fluid. All right, moving on to our disability assessment. So once we've covered A, B, and C, the next thing we want to think about is our patient's neurologic status. So we always want to formally assess their level of consciousness. The Glasgow Coma Scale is what's used most commonly for this, and we're going to talk about that in some detail in our head injury lecture. Um, however, you can also use the abbreviated AVPU scale, which stands for alert, verbal, pain, or unresponsive, meaning your patient is alert and normal, they respond on only to verbal stimuli, they respond only to painful stimuli, or they're completely unresponsive. And as you can imagine, patients who only respond to pain or don't respond at all are clearly very ill and you should be very concerned about them. While we're doing our neurologic survey, we always want to look at the pupils. Uh, pupillary function gives us a sense of whether the patient has a focal uh, neurologic lesion or not. We want to look for four extremity movement um, to make sure that there's not any evidence of neurologic focality that might suggest a brain or a spinal cord injury. 
we want to look for external signs of head or neck trauma um, that might point us in the direction of a significant uh, head or neck injury. And lastly, if our patient is in any way, shape, or form altered, we want to check their glucose. Now, clearly, trauma doesn't make you hypoglycemic, but remember, trauma is always precipitated by some event, right? And it's not uncommon that people with medical illnesses will sustain trauma. So if your patient became hypoglycemic, that made them confused, and then they crashed their car, you know, clearly they're going to have both the medical problem that precipitated the event as well as the traumatic injury for you to deal with. So you want to make sure that you're considering the big picture for your patient, checking their glucose, and checking other, uh, for other signs of medical illness that might have contributed to the current event today. All right, there are a number of neurologic life threats that we're looking for on our primary survey, and we're going to talk in more detail about these in future lectures, but these include any type of penetrating cranial injury, intracranial hemorrhage, diffuse axonal injury, and also um, high spinal cord injuries like C-spine injuries. In the realm of intracranial hemorrhage, we have a variety of different uh, disease entities to think about. We've got our subdural hematomas, our epidural hematomas, our traumatic subarachnoids, and then lastly, intraparenchymal and intraventricular bleeding. All of these are managed differently, um, and we're going to talk about them in detail in a future lecture. So what are we going to do initially in our primary survey for patients who show signs of significant neurologic impairment? Well, first and foremost, if their GCS is below 8, we want to go ahead and intubate. Patients who are significantly comatose are not going to be able to maintain their own airways. So it's very, very important that we manage the airway and make sure that, um, uh, that the patient maintains a stable airway for the duration of their care. We're also, of course, going to op optimize their oxygenation and their perfusion. Um, so we're going to be giving them supplemental oxygen. If they're intubated, we're going to be placing them on a ventilator. And we're going to give fluids, blood, et cetera, to ensure that they have adequate systemic perfusion. We do want to obtain emergent uh, cranial imaging for any patient who has a significant neurologic disability on our evaluation. And the test of choice is really non-contrast head CT, but obviously we're not going to initiate that until the patient is stable from an ABC perspective. And again, um, there are specific disease entities that we're looking for, and how we manage those is going to vary depending on our CT findings. So we're going to talk in more detail about how we would approach each one of these injury types as we move forward. Lastly, after we've covered A, B, C, and D, we want to think about exposing the patient. This is really, really important. You've got to take all their clothes off. You've got to get all the coverings off. You don't want to miss any injuries. And I can't tell you how many times in my own practice I've seen injuries that are missed because people don't undress their patients. So get the clothes off, get the sheets off, get a good look head to toe at the patient's entire skin. While you're doing that, however, you want to avoid hypothermia. So hypothermia causes coagulopathy and exacerbates bleeding and trauma. So you want to expose your patient and look at them. But once you've done that, get them covered up again. Make sure you keep the room warm. Make sure you use warm blankets because trauma patients can actually become hypothermic very quickly. Lastly, you're going to complete a head-to-toe exam. So you want to make sure that you look not only at the obvious stuff, but in the, all the nooks and crannies. You want to look up in the axillae, in the peritoneum. You want to roll the patient over to examine the back, obviously, while maintaining C-spine immobilization. Um, and you want to also make sure you get a look at the back of the head and the neck, which is especially important in patients wearing cervical collars. We often miss those if we don't remove the collar to examine the patient. So take home points from this lecture. You've got to do a primary survey in all of your trauma patients. You've got to do it the same way every single time so that you don't miss things. You've got to be super systematic about this. You want to make sure that you look for specific life threats in the A, B, C, and D domains. And you want to treat those as you identify them. You want to know the differential of consequence for A, B, C, and D so that you know what you're looking for. Um, when you are doing your primary survey. And if you follow these steps, you're going to have a successful trauma resuscitation for all of your patients. Thank you.